If the world's most cartoonishly evil organization was hunting you down in the midst of a global zombie apocalypse they unleashed, what would you do? The Umbrella Corporation's done it again. This time, their attempt at creating an over-the-counter antidepressant resulted in mindless hordes of undead cannibals completely overtaking the entire planet. Now, their number one priority is capturing the daughter of their top former scientist to further their goal of world domination. And they couldn't care less who gets caught in a crossfire. Hmm, what is this sound familiar? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Umbrella Corporation in Resident Evil. Before we jump into the apocalypse, allow me to wind the clock back to the long lost year of 2022, back when everything was normal. It all started when twin sisters Billy and Jade moved to the South African cookie cutter suburb known as Raccoon City 2. Don't worry about what happened to the first one. Anyway, the girls are here because their dad, Albert Wesker, is a big shot scientist at Umbrella, working on their line of direct-to-consumer happy pills. You heard me right, Albert Wesker is a soccer dad now. Only, this isn't the same exterminate the weak with the super virus, Albert Wesker we've all come to know and love. Nah, this guy is just some sissy soft clone cranked out by the OG to do all his science homework. Things start to get interesting when Billy goes into the office one day to meet her dad for lunch. While in the waiting room, she spots a push cart coming through full of caged rabbit, and being the well-adjusted human she is, she just accepts that animal testing is a shitty but necessary part of the pharmaceutical industry. Nah, she actually has a full-on vegan brain meltdown, and decides right then and there that she, a 14-year-old girl, is going to infiltrate the deepest confines of a massive monolithic corporation and expose their secret to the entire world, you know, so they can have their pita creds taken away or something. Of course, she could have just snapped a couple pics and posted them on the spot, but where's the fun in that? Besides, she won't be doing this alone. Joining her on this little self-delete run is her poorly dispositioned sister, Jade, just in case she needs someone to treat other people like garbage. Speaking of Lord of the Rings, did you know that you can put the fate of Middle-earth in the palm of your hand with this video's sponsor, The Lord of the Rings Rise to War? The Lord of the Rings Rise to War is a simulation strategy game where you fight to conquer and occupy resource territories over the vast and unforgiving Middle Earth like a true war hero. Flex your non-existent skills and diplomacy with a multi-layer social structure composed of 12 factions and fellowships which will inevitably end in conflict. I have no idea whose idea it was to give you authority over the likes of Aragorn, Legolas, Gandalf, Arwen, Sauron, and more characters in the lore like Radagast the Brown. But here we are, with millions of lives in your hands and a cabinet full of OG badasses whose advice you'll surely skip through. Not not only do you, should you, communicate to other factions with strategies, but you also need to use your wisdom to occupy Dol Guldur and claim the ring for yourself. <clears throat> I mean, destroy it in the volcano. This month, the Lord of the Rings Rise to War is celebrating its anniversary in the game. You can install the game to get tons of rewards. Limited package, the Hobbit's Adventure Package, Gandalf's Fireworks, enjoy the Middle Earth Grand Fireworks Show, Bilbo's Riddles, Mysteries of Middle Earth, Tales from Middle Earth, Challenge the Epic Instant with more gameplay challenges for you to explore. Use my link in the description or scan my QR code to download The Lord of the Rings Rise to War and get the limited Hobbit's adventure package. That night, the girls scooter over to the Umbrella HQ after stealing their dad's security badge. I mean, sure, it'll implicate you all immediately and cost your dad his job or worse, but rabbit lives matter? Okay, fine. That'll get you in the front door, but what about the internal security? There are no guards. Everything's automated. That's not gonna make your little B&E any easier. Sorry, that's the old umbrella. The one that actually cared about security while also constantly having containment breaches. The new umbrella is a softer, gentler, evil organization. After all, just look at this hideously malformed bear mascot thing they used to market to children. It turns out they made their building so smart, they made it stupid. The Wonder Twins defeat the facial recognition scanner at the door by just shining a really bright light up at the camera. Because a good security system always allows you to bypass key components 
components of a multi-factor authentication system whenever you feel like it. As for the cameras inside that might realize two people have entered when only one person has a pass, well, there's none. It's Biosyn all over again, and we're just getting started. Down in the animal testing labs, Billy starts snapping away at every last lab rat, rabbit, and monkey, but it turns out there's no service down there. So instead of waiting all of five minutes to share the pics once she's topside, she asks Jay to log into one of the nearby workstations using their dad's credentials, which just so happen to be the exact same ones used on their joint Netflix account. Naturally, she immediately starts poking around in some of the files, only to stumble across footage from a drug trial gone horribly wrong down in Tijuana. Meanwhile, Billy's wrapping up the photo shoot when she notices a reinforced steel container off in its own section of the laboratory. What's in the box? What's in the Fox. Never mind why a shady biopharmaceutical company with innumerable government contracts would want to keep something contained. It's probably just the Energizer Bunny. Billy swipes her father's keycard over the scanner, which immediately sounds an alarm. But that's not about to stop this little eco geek from scooching in for the close up. When the door finally swings open, the sight of what's inside pretty much instantly makes her lose control of her legs. <laughs> Nice try, Owen Grady. Everyone knows the force only works on dinosaurs. Seriously though, you should probably grab some of the nearby lab equipment and get ready to put old Yeller out of his misery. No way in hell you're gonna be able to outrun this thing. Oh wait, my mistake. I forgot we're dealing with a couple of superheroes here. So obviously, Umbrella would expect their top scientist to know better than to accidentally free the T-virus infected Doberman from a small box they were keeping it in. But man, they could have at least tried taking some amount of action to prevent it. I mean, if nothing else, a simple sticky note saying super dangerous zombie dog would have been nice, but there really should have been some kind of multi-stage process for releasing it. Like maybe a pop-up asking if you're really, really sure you want to unleash a world-ending plague on all of humanity. Maybe a synchronized two-key system like we use for nukes. The girls manage to take the elevator back up to the main floor, but Cujo's not far behind them. After losing their tail in one of the boardrooms, Billy and Jade make for the exit only to find it locked up tight. Their attempt at spoofing their way through the recording of their dad's voice fails. But before they can try again, El Dago leaps through one of the nearby windows and proceeds to rip the living shit out of Billy before Jade can take it out with a fire extinguisher. And that's what happens when you go poking around in cutting edge underground laboratories. Honestly, you should consider yourself lucky the Red Queen didn't reduce you to a small puddle on the tile floor. That said, Billy ain't looking so good. It might have been a better idea to just hit the emergency stop back in the elevator and just face the consequences of your teenaged angst once Honk shows up to send Fido off to a nice farm upstate. Speaking of which, where's the small army of heavily armed commandos responding to the alarm going off? K Jewelers has better security than this, and they don't even sell bioweapons. I think. Uh, well, might be for the best. Otherwise, Billy could very well wind up in a box of her own, or sprawled out on a dissection table. Actually, that's not really the worst outcome. Fortunately, Albert Wesker's response time is miles ahead of anyone else at the company. Fear not, children. Daddy's here to wipe away all repercussions and make sure you learn absolutely nothing from this experience. You don't have to take her home. She needs a hospital. Great idea. I'm sure they won't immediately connect your sister's horrific bite wounds to the dog-related incident that took place over at the lab. Umbrella completely owns this town, including the police, so we should probably do what he says before the three of us <coughs> accidentally end up like that dog. According to Dr. Dad, no major blood vessels were hit and her condition is relatively stable. She's just in shock. Although... <laughs> Come on, dude. Did you not see that dog? Let's hope he can at least use his connections to get his hands on a rabies prophylaxis. For what will probably be the first and only time in her life, Jade does what she's told, and Buddy carries her sister out the back door and all the way home. And apparently, we're supposed to believe that none of the responding security personnel, nor anyone in any of the surrounding neighborhoods, noticed a pair of teenagers pulling a three-legged race while covered in blood. Meanwhile, Wesker Sr. stays behind to cover their tracks by uploading a a computer virus to make the whole instant look like the result of an external hack, even going so far as to slather himself with some of that sweet, sweet zombie dog blood. I hope you didn't cut yourself shaving this morning. And speaking of the mystery mutt, it turns out man's best friend was part of a drug trial gone wrong, resulting in the Tijuana incident Jade found on her dad's computer. The drug in question, an over-the-counter chill pill called Joy that Umbrella is currently planning to unleash upon the masses. Now, you might ask yourself, how does an anti 
tied to present, turn a Doberman into this thing? Well, would it surprise you if I said it had to do with the T-Virus? That's right, 24 years since Raccoon City 1 had to nuke itself, and it seems these jokers are still dead set on turning a profit with this lunacy. But what do you do when even the most ruthless governments on the planet refuse to shell out for your special war crime potion? Well, obviously, you put it in a capsule and sell it on the open market as some kind of mood enhancer. Well, I don't see this as a problem. I say don't see that as a problem. It's not very cash money of you. What are you, some kind of safety nerd? Clearly, it's no secret to the folks at the top that they're playing with fire. But it's all good, because according to their animal trials, once people are sufficiently hooked on this garbage, you can use flashing lights and colors to subliminally rewire their brains, like Coco Melon. As CEO and all-around terrible human being, Evelyn Marcus explains, they'll then be able to rent this influence out to the highest bidder, or use it to further their own noble agenda. Hmm, I wonder where they got that idea. Nice try, lady. We already have a foolproof formula for shilling crap that nobody needs. It's called influencer marketing. <laughs> Gets them every time. Unfortunately for poor Billy, the fact that she was just exposed to an extremely infectious zombie pathogen with no known cure means she'll be spending what little remains of her life chained to a radiator in Wesker's basement. <laughs> Nah, they actually treat it like it's the flu. Seriously, Albert himself knows firsthand exactly how dangerous this virus is, and the girls are still able to wear him down into letting her go back to school after only three days. Which, by the way, is exactly what he determined to be the average incubation period for the virus. Eh, whatever, she seems alright. Maybe it was just a dry bite. <laughs> See, just fine. Meanwhile, Jade's determined to find more information on what exactly went down in Tijuana, which results in her connecting with investigative journalist extraordinaire Angel Rubio, who was blacklisted by Umbrella after blowing the lid off the incident. Angel fills her in on all the gory details, including what happened to the people bitten by the very same dog that mauled her sister. And what do you think she does with this information? Did you guess take Billy to a party with dozens of potential victims for her to infect? If so, give yourself 500 nerd points. They will serve as a de facto form of currency when the world ends next month. Despite the proverbial sort of Democles hanging over her head, Daddy's little plague rat still manages to have some semblance of a good time amongst her peers. Such a good time, in fact, it turns out she's somehow been magically cured of the infection. I guess after decades of research and countless lives lost, the answer was the power of friendship this whole time. Yeah, she basically just shrugged off certain death like it was nothing, which, as we'll find out later, is pretty much in the family. The good times rolled to an abrupt stop, however, when Jade's journalist pal Stranger Dangers is way to a teen party looking for his confidential informant. Evidently, he still has enough of a chip on his shoulder to come all the way from Mexico just to have a chance at revenge against Umbrella for destroying his career. I need to know who is infected, okay? Tell me, tell me. Unfortunately, no one's there to earhole this nut job before he can uncover cover Billy's little secret, but it looks like his Pulitzer's gonna have to wait. Umbrella's finest have been clocking him since the moment he arrived in town, and it seems they have a few questions of their own. Oh, and guess who's gonna ask them? That corpo life, man. Always throwing extra hats at ya. Well, the good news for Louis Bloom is that Wesker couldn't care less that he knows anything about Tijuana. After all, Umbrella can just use their media cronies to suppress and discredit anything he might try and publish on the subject. You know, like real journalists. The bad news, however, is that this is clearly Angel's first time getting tortured, as he almost immediately brings up the Billy situation. I know your daughters. Nice. I'm sure he's not sensitive about his kids and all. Pro tip to all you super sleuths out there. If you ever find yourself strapped to a chair next to an entire dentist office worth of pain inducers, you probably shouldn't do or say anything that gives the Inquisitor a personal stake in causing you immense suffering. That said, in this case, he just bought himself an easy out. Knowing exactly what will happen to his family if Umbrella finds out about Billy being infected, Albert decides to shut Angel up 
permanently. Under the pretense of it acting as a sort of truth serum, he juices the prisoner up with none other than everyone's favorite MacGuffin, the T-Virus. I mean, is there anything this stuff can't do? Ultimately, the plan works out a little too well, prompting the boss lady to lock Albert up under suspicion of foul play. But what she and literally everyone else in the circus fails to realize is that their security is so pathetically awful, even a bunch of stupid kids armed with basic home electronics can blow right past it. Through an extremely convoluted series of events involving Olive Garden, Kung Fu, and even more clones, the girls find out about their dad's incarceration. Oh, and Billy gets captured. Now, it's up to Jade to bail them both out before things get weird. Fortunately, she knows just who to call. There are clones in this story, Jade. I know. Just go with it, dude. Besides, we all know she's got you wrapped around her little finger. Using her boy toy's special hacker skills, Jade and Simon sneak into the Umbrella HQ via the parking garage. You know, because a 14-year-old boy definitely has the wherewithal to deactivate a state-of-the-art security system with nothing but an iPhone. Besides, don't you think they would have dramatically beefed up their security presence, given they're holding two people against their will? One of which being a carrier for the most devastating viral and infection to ever exist. Of course not. In fact, they were both left completely unguarded, which is why Billy's currently wandering aimlessly through the facility while Albert's just hanging out in the torture chamber. Naturally, the whole family regroups in a matter of minutes because what exactly was going to get in their way, right? Only then, once they're on the verge of escaping, do we actually see any sign of life from the security team. However, as it turns out, Mr. Wesker's got a little more of the OG in him than we initially realized. Damn, dude, where was that when they locked you up earlier? The gang manages to break line of sight, but it's only a matter of time before backup arrives and surrounds the entire building. Realizing this, Albert decides to invoke the nuclear option to give Billy and Jade a chance to escape. After MacGyvering up a Moab using a bunch of compressed gas canisters they just have lying around for some reason, the Wesker family says its final goodbyes before Father of the Year ignites the charges and levels half the building. Yes, such a noble sacrifice on his behalf, except I wonder what possible repercussions might unfold as a direct result of nuking a laboratory dedicated to the study of highly transmissible mutagenic viruses. I guess we'd better get back to the future and see what the damage is. The year is 2036, and boy, things have really gone downhill. Over the last 14 years, more than 90% of the world's population has turned into zombies. Although, here in 2022, I'd say about three quarters of us are already there. Either way, it's really starting to get annoying, which is why Jade has spent the last six months in total isolation studying the shambling hordes of London in search of a viral mutation the survivors can exploit. Apparently, shooting, exploding, and otherwise annihilating the zombies with the plentiful military hardware proliferated by every major power on Earth has just gotten old. So now, they're looking for a more turnkey resolution to the end of days. Never mind the fact that the T-Virus is rapidly mutating billions of zombies differently all over the world, rendering any vulnerability of a temporary mutation she finds on a handful of local zombies that she's somehow able to weaponize in her soup kitchen lab useless. After wrangling up a hoppy boy from the mobile pet co beside her camp, Jade spritzes up with the latest Semper sample before heading deeper into the city to visit her favorite pack of flesh-eating ghouls. Once at the scene of the impending goat rodeo, she gives Peter Rabbit a prick on the ear and plants him in a patch of grass all of 10 yards away from a tiny enclosed kiosk she'll be observing from. Yeah. Also, never mind the fact that telephotos exist, or that the trail camera you're using is perfectly capable of recording things completely free of human involvement. Nah, it's much better to linger right next to the bait you laid out and just assume nothing could possibly go wrong. Right on cue, the deaf and blind denizens of a nearby metro station catch a whiff of thumper and begin shambling their way down the bunny trail in pursuit of fast food. However, much to Jade's dismay, not so much as a single one of them even tries reciting Tennyson in the process. Act 2426 still shows no sign of leadership structure or higher brain function. I'm calling pot and kettle on that one. These freaks managed to sniff out a single drop of rabbit blood from over 30 yards away through a pane glass window, and you're just casually sitting beside them thinking a couple spurts of sauvage is going to keep you from getting munched. Uh-oh, a small cut on your exposed skin. Who could have seen that coming? Better get a move on before the bloodthirsty pack of man-eating corpses comes Naruto running after you like it's Area 51. Seriously though, 
What's with all this short sleeve garbage? Did it never occur to you that you might catch a boo-boo while crawling around a crusty old tetanus factory filled with jagged metal and broken glass? You should be buttoned up like the Astartes right now. Maybe, just maybe, I'd be inclined to cut her some slack if she'd bother to bring along something to defend herself besides Carrie's dad's old folding knife. We live in the future now. Give me an MCX spear light and a few D60s full of green tip and I'll show you why the zombie apocalypse ain't ever gonna happen. Oh, well, who needs portable self-defense when you can just hightail it through a twisting maze of concrete corridors back to your completely exposed campsite? That little circle of trust thing you got going on there better do its job. Wow, an incendiary safe space. How very Gen Z. I especially like how the flamethrowers blow man-sized targets off their feet without tipping over and spinning uncontrollably across the ground. Chew on that, Isaac Newton. For real though, it really sucks that you have to hit the button on the towers with Sekiro level timing to even have a chance at keeping the horde out. Not to mention that now instead of being chased by zombies, you're being chased by zombies on fire. These things don't even feel pain, so unless the plan is to overload their magic olfactory nerves with the smell of burning flesh, they're probably just gonna blow by the space heaters and tear you limb from limb while also roasting you alive. Whatever. Evidently, it all worked out just fine. Sure, most of the brain eaters didn't even have their clothes burnt off and half of them are still twitching, but don't let that stop you from tiptoeing through the tulips to throw your little temper tantrum. Nah, I get it. Now you'll have to find a new flock to follow around. And after making so much progress with this last one, damn. I'll bet any day now they're gonna gonna snap right out of it and get back to mindlessly staring at their cell phones. Here's an idea. How about instead of sending invaluable researchers out into the wasteland with six months worth of rabbits and a gas station pocket knife, you build some kind of secure containment facility and bring the monsters back to you? Then you could watch them all day long without having to worry about running from the bulls through Stalingrad every time someone gets a paper cut. Hmm. On second thought, some dirty worthless hippie would probably free them all in the dead of the night as part of their live and let live approach to combating the undead. Unfortunately for Jade, not everything in this city has lost its sense of hearing. It seems all that racket from the proximity alarm stirred up something a lot worse than zombies. <laughs> I'd hate to see the butterfly that comes out of that. Using her expert survival skills, the stalwart zombologist crawls halfway under the nearest train car and just sort of banks on it, completely forgetting it ever saw her. Yeah, better hope your daddy's got a particular set of skills with that hiding place. Why wouldn't you at least try tucking your legs up in there to make it that much harder for this thing to grab you? The big ugly drags Jade kicking and screaming from the wreckage to test the ragdoll physics a bit before body slamming her into the rabbit car. But instead of a immediately following up with the people's elbow and canceling this mess a few months early, it decides to pull back a bit and screech at her a couple times. You see, mutant caterpillars are notorious for their excessive celebrations, and it's a good thing too, because it turns out there was a heavily armed hobo militia waiting just around the corner to smoke this turkey. <laughs> Great work, gents. I see you too have studied the ancient and deadly art of mag dumping into trash. Seriously though, it's a miracle Jade didn't catch a stray one off one of those half-baked airsoft LARPers. For Christ's sake, friggin' cue ball over here doesn't even have a front sight on his rifle. Oh well, nice of them to carry our unconscious body God knows how far back to their base instead of cooking us up right there on the spot. Or you know, worse. Sometime later, Jade wakes up in a filthy field hospital, wearing a gown someone else almost certainly died in. After getting back in a costume and catching up on the latest corporate propaganda, she decides to kick things off on the right foot by immediately making demands of the people that saved her life. I need to get back to my camp. We can make that happen tomorrow. Now. Gee, I guess the words thank you for stopping a horrible insect monster from eating me alive must have changed a bit over the years. Or are you assuming you just respond at the nearest hospital like it's GTA? Whatever the case, science is gonna have to wait this time. Turns out their one single helicopter is off assisting other callers. And as for driving, well, that might be a bit of a problem, seeing as how the entire compound is completely surrounded by a few hundred zeros. That said, if these things are hypersensitive, 
sensitive to smells, you'd think they'd be dogpiling this dumb World War Z style. Must have looted a truckload of Axe body spray on their last raid or something. And speaking of piles of rotten corpses, where the hell are they? What do you people do around here all day? It sure isn't home improvement, I'll tell you that. This place looks like something I built in Fallout 4 after a night of heavy drinking. If you can only send out one team at a time in a helicopter, anyone with free time should be up on the wall stacking zombies around the clock. Okay, sure, maybe my Americanness is showing, thinking a bunch of Brits would have enough ammo on hand to play rooftop Rambo all day. But these guys have clearly spent some time at Rock Island Auction House. And it's not like they were squeezing them off gently during the bug hunt earlier. Worst case scenario, you could just cut a few murder holes in the lower parts of the walls and take turns spearing them through the head when they come in for a closer sniff. There was what, 300 million humans left on this planet? But six billion of them. I don't think you can kill them all. Oh really? Let's break that one down mathematically, shall we? Six billion of them means the 300 million of us only have to kill a measly 20 zombies apiece to memory hold this episode. Sure, not everyone will be up to the task of cracking skulls, but I'm sure there'd be no shortage of doomers willing to rack up more than their fair share. And that's disregarding the fact that even a single state in America probably has enough firepower to eliminate the six billion zombies. Sorry, science nerd, this situation doesn't call for year-long observations of the dead body dominance hierarchy. It calls for lawn chairs and Dr. Pepper. It just ton of violence, if I haven't already made that clear. Sadly, before Jade can launch into her doctoral dissertation on zombie dance therapy, her helpful host lets the cat out of the bag on the big sneaky they've been pulling. It turns out, she's number one on Umbrella's Most Wanted, and this weasel's looking to cash in on the free ticket to paradise they're offering for her capture. Right on schedule, a pair of Umbrella helicopters swoop in from nowhere to airdrop Jack Black and a couple dozen stormtroopers. You know, for a bunch of free folk living rough beyond the wall, you all seem pretty nonchalant about a platoon-sized force of heavily armed corpos escorting a pudgy pencil pusher into the heart of your base. You might want to consider getting into fighting positions in case they decide they'd rather not invite a gaggle of unwashed scavengers up into their ivory tower. Because, I mean, they have no reason to bring you. You have no leverage once you give over the package. Especially when you're dealing with the Umbrella Corp, who literally manufactured this entire apocalypse. Just saying, the whole thing's about Bad idea. Like any good lapdog, the head scav immediately runs over to lick the boots of his corporate overlords, and by the looks of it, they really appreciate his unwavering loyalty. <laughs> Man, even the biopharmaceutical corporations just can't be trusted. Truly, the end is nigh. I'll give him points for style, but it might have been a better idea to do that after you secured the high value target. Especially since someone could have easily been clocking you with an L96A1 from the moment you stepped off the chopper. Better yet, grab the girl, then just jet off in the chopper and launch a Hellfire missile into the side of their homeless man's helm's deep. Now you're forced to mow down every last one of these chavs while also searching for the mark and making sure she doesn't get clapped in the crossfire. With the School of Rock now in session, Jade exploits the chaos to shed her one inept guard and disappear into the junkyard. Should have gone for his AR in the process though. Something tells me that perfume trick is not going to get you very far with these guys. Then again, they did go about this whole exercise with all the cunning of a brain dead beagle. So what the hell, right? Seriously, have none of you morons ever run a hostage exchange before? What's the point of letting her walk around unshackled when you were planning to turn her over the whole time? The scavs should have kept her zip tied to the gurney and just wheeled her up to the laning pad before the choppers came in. At that point, if the super troopers start trying to force their way downstairs, you know something's up. As for Team Umbrella, you literally have two helicopters on them right now. Just work the weirdos long enough to secure the cargo and then strafe the place with AGMs and minigun fire until there's nothing left higher than a corn stalk. Ultimately, the scavengers proved to be no match for the technologically superior assault team and it's only a matter of time before the attackers are sweeping through on cleanup duty. Meanwhile, Jade decides the safest place for her to be is up on the wall. You know, right between the ruthless mercenary commandos hunting her down like a dog and a 50-foot drop to a horde of mindless killing machines. And sure enough, that's exactly what it comes down to. Now, the question is, do you accept defeat and leave with a bunch of murderers or make a blind leap of faith into the darkness and hope for the best? Let me know what you do in the comments. As for Jade, she takes option B. Good thing there's a nice, soft cargo van for her to land on. <laughs> 
See, nothing to it. At least she had the sense to hit the ground rolling to spread out the impact, although it was nowhere near a slam dunk. Sure, it's not out of the question for someone to survive a fall from that height, but they definitely won't be happy when they hit the ground. And considering a sprained ankle out here pretty much is a death sentence, it might have been better to risk catching a bullet or two looking for another way down. Oh, well, it's not gonna matter now that we're surrounded by a horde of sense-seeking freakazoids. Should probably keep a can of Febreze on us at all times, given they can only find us by smell. Although, you'd think they'd be going bonkers trying to find a way into the base, given how many gallons of fresh blood are currently leaking out all over the place. Evidently, that price on Jade's head wasn't meant for bits and pieces, as Shallow Hal orders his goons to waste any zombies that get near her. However, before they're able to send a team down to plug her in the kneecaps and haul her back to base, one of the last remaining scavengers plows through the gates in an up-armored Land Rover, pausing just long enough for her to climb on top. Wow, looks like everyone's saving her ass today. Of course, they just had to go and cover this thing in easy handholds the meatbags could use to climb up to, a la Donna the Dead. Fortunately, the mercs are still wildly spraying bullets to keep the heat off us as we ride off into the sunset. It's too bad the umbrella jerks can easily spin up their helicopters and chase us down in a matter of seconds. I mean, it would be too bad if they were actually smart enough to do it. Seriously though, did those things run out of gas or something? They could have cleared out every single shambler in a half mile radius and still had time to chase us down, especially since we're dependent on all these added spotlights just to see what's around us. Eventually, the getaway car comes to a tunnel where apparently some idiot thought it'd be a great idea to cap the roof clearance just barely above a standard SUV. I want to tuck and roll before that broken pipe fucks your day up. I mean, it's not exactly foolproof, but the dirt here looks pretty soft. And given we've seen Jade bounce off two solid car bodies without so much as a scratch, she'll probably pop right back up like Caitlyn Ohashi. <laughs> Jesus, Jade, was your plan really to watch it coming the whole way? Don't you have, like, a family and stuff? It's a good thing the driver heard our cries for help and slammed on the brakes before we got intubated. Although, now he's holding us at gunpoint. Kind of makes you wonder why he would have bothered stopping to pick us up and then save our lives, only to immediately try to get rid of us. That jagged piece of steel would have definitely taken care of that. In any case, this seems like a conversation we should be having through the sunroof. After all, there's been somewhat of a zombie apocalypse happening happening recently. Nah, it's fine. Just go ahead and put yourself as far away from the driver's seat as possible with your back to the impenetrable darkness. It's not like we might have to make a quick getaway or anything. Jade tries to rope him into a help me help you type arrangement, and it looks like he's actually willing to go for it. Oh, except guess what? You took too long, and now it's raining zombies. It's nothing a Beretta PX4 can't fix, right? Yeah, this is when you immediately jump back into the vehicle and GTFO before the smell of fresh blood brings in a whole herd. And you got Aiden. See, that's what you get for having inconsistent motivation. Well, the good news is we have wheels now. The bad news is those wheels are on a Land Rover. The most unrealistic thing about this dumpster fire is the idea that this souped up Brit box would still be running without any dealerships around. After driving all night, Jade reaches the White Cliff of Dover. Unfortunately, it seems the whole city part has seen better days. This disgusting alleyway full of garbage seems like a great place to park your vehicle. It's not like it's a rare and invaluable resource right now or anything. Why not just leave the keys under the visor while you're at it? I'm sure it'll be right where you left it when you get back. It turns out Umbrella was awarded the security contract for the entire city because there's so much competition. Anyway, as a result, the place is pretty much crawling with talking balaclavas. With all the these uniforms around, we should probably find another way to conceal our identity besides a simple hood. After all, if the scavengers were able to figure out who we were, actual umbrella soldiers shouldn't have any trouble, especially if Kung Fu Panda radioed ahead. A hat and glasses would make for a much more effective disguise and would also be a bit more socially acceptable. Unless you're a Jedi, nothing says I don't want to be recognized like wearing a hood in broad daylight and night's weather. Oh, or you could just stare straight up at the surveillance drones. I'm sure facial recognition software hasn't improved at all in the last 14 years. Jade makes her way to an apartment belonging to an old smuggler contact, Barry. According to his wife, Mom,
Melinda, he's not home. But do you think Jade cares? Hell no. She just walks in like she owns the place. Besides, I'm sure people surviving through the rapture are totally fine with strangers entering their homes uninvited. Jesus, lady, got enough cats? I can smell this place from here. It's a good thing the ration cards allow you to walk away with 50 pounds of friskies every week. Gonna go ahead and say wherever Barry's gone, I don't think he's coming back. No way someone who's hoarded that many animals is not single. Jade bullies her way through the furry wasteland to make use of the satcom setup that apparently everyone has just laying around these days. Upon reconnecting with her husband back at home base, she's told she needs to cross the English Channel to Kalai's for extraction. With the Umbrella Run ferry out of the question, she once again leans on Melinda for Barry's assistance in getting across. But before the crazy cat lady can properly deflect the conversation, a sudden commotion draws Jade's attention to the bathroom. Damn, Melinda, how very jigsaw of you. Would he forget to leave the seat down or something? Unfortunately, solving the mystery of Barry's disappearance doesn't do a thing for Jade's situation. With no other options, she implores Melinda for any information she might have on some of his former associates. Apparently, we're in luck. It turns out Barry kept thorough records of all of his prior business dealings in his handy dandy pocketbook. Except, take a wild guess where he keeps it. Sorry, Zom Barry, gonna have to put you down. Hey, Melinda, got any? Anything we can use to bash his brains in? Like a cast iron skillet or maybe a morning star? I'm kidding, of course. It couldn't possibly be that simple. No, our hostess is insistent that we keep him alive. Or, well, moving around at least. Marriage is complicated. Oh, it is? Yeah, something tells me you two are beyond counseling at this point. So unless your custom wedding vows included something about chaining each other up to bathroom fixtures, I'd say it's time to start working on your dating profile. Honestly, I say we just stab the poor bastard in the eye socket and deal with Melinda's wailing afterwards. What is she gonna do? Tattle on us for killing the cannibal corpse she's been harboring in her bathroom? Something that's probably punishable by instant death. Oh, well, this isn't gonna be easy, but at least Jade has the good sense to improvise some Brad Pitt body armor before going in. Although I question her choice in armaments. You couldn't find anything better than a wooden spoon in a cheap plastic tub? We're not teaching him table manners here. We need something we can use to create distance if things go sideways. Since we can't, or I guess won't, put him out of his misery, we should try to inhibit his sensory perception to make it harder for him to fight back while shaking him down. It looks like he was fairly recently zombified, so he's still probably operating on sight and sound, instead of just smell like the brunt of the undead. Knowing this, once we got his free arm out of the way, I'd try covering his head with something opaque, like they do to transport crocodiles. I mean, it's not like we have to worry about him suffocating. After that, we'll just need something we can use to bind his limbs, like duct tape or rope. Actually, we might be able to accomplish both of these tasks by tossing a heavy quilt or comforter over his head, and then tying it securely around his arms with whatever we can find. Sure, it's gonna ruin it, but who cares? It's not our stuff, and besides, we can clearly strong arm Melinda into giving us whatever we want. Ultimately, Jade's able to wrestle the notebook away from Barry's remains, but not before his rotting wrist breaks apart at the handcuff. Don't worry though, apparently he's got another hand under that old one just waiting to go. Now free from his imprisonment, the killer cadaver blows by Jade and form tackles Melinda for a right proper domestic, but before he can send her off to Jesus with the mother of all hickeys, Jade comes in clutch with a surprise stab to the back of the head. You killed him! Sweet Jesus, Fisher! What did you do? Well, saw that coming. God, it's like everyone left on Earth is just chowing down on crazy pills. It's not very polite, but we should have probably just dipped with the notebook and let poetic justice run its course. Besides, now she's almost certainly gonna narc on us the first chance she gets. With that disaster out of the way, Jade heads on down to the local pub to meet with Barry's former business partner, who runs an underground ferry operation. However, it seems the old smuggler didn't exactly leave that relationship on the best of terms. Unable to afford the added premium, Jade decides to just swipe an access to from a local bar fly. Cause, you know, screw that guy, right? I'm sure if he really needed it, he would have guarded it more carefully. Later that night, she and a couple hundred other desperate travelers arrive at the docks to embark on their illicit exodus. However, it turns out Umbrella also caught wind of the operation. Apparently, they're so concerned with the safety of their subjugates, they'd rather gun them all down with quadcopters than let them risk crossing the channel unsupervised. Those are rubber bullets, right? 
Yes, and I'm sure all the explosions are just confetti launchers. Whatever they are, for some reason, everyone here thinks they can outrun them by sprinting straight ahead down a narrow boardwalk. Spoiler alert, it doesn't go so well. Yeah, the rest of you can race machine guns all you want. Those of us that actually want to live should jump over the side and hide underwater for as long as possible. Bullets don't travel through water very well, and typically, the faster the projectiles moving upon impact with the surface, the less it's able to penetrate into the water. Although, I'd still swim down as deep as I could just to be safe. From there, I would just swim under the dock and hide out until things quieted down. Of course, had we gone that route, we wouldn't have been able to cash in on this free Kiapa Rhino double action revolver dropped by some rando that didn't invest enough points in plot armor. Sweet. I'm sure this will absolutely play a pivotal role in our survival and not get carelessly pissed away without a second thought. Jade manages to survive the onslaught long enough to take cover behind a thin metal drum, but the cries of a pinned down child force her back into the fray. After scooping up the brat, the two of them take cover inside yet another thin metal object, instead of hiding behind one of the many concrete barriers littered about the area. Once the shooting subsides, Jack Black and his troops begin searching through the carnage for any sign of Jade, but apparently none of them think to look inside the giant shipping container parked right out in the open. Then again, it's possible they didn't think anyone would be dumb enough to actually try and hide in there. Suddenly, the doors swing open, and in walks another pair of survivors. Turns out, they're this bedwetter's parents. The group holds up in the tin can overnight, because, once again, none of the highly trained mercenary commandos ever thought to look inside it. With her natural inclination to avoid conflict as much as possible, Jade takes the opportunity to criticize the parenting decisions of her new roommate, and tells them they should have just taken the umbrella boat. However, it turns out this seemingly wholesome party of three is actually a gang of hardened criminals. You're smuggling contraband. 40 year old contraband. <gasps> The poor children. What is this, the 1920s? Aren't there more important things to be worrying about than people catching a buzz? Like putting an end to the active zombie apocalypse threatening human existence? <laughs> what am I saying? Of course, daddy government's gonna find a way to squeeze out every last nickel they can in liquor licenses. Gotta make sure people know not to serve underage brain eaters. With this avenue of escape off the table, the survivors are left to find a new way across the channel, which naturally leads them to discussing the channel, although apparently it's incredibly dangerous. Given what we've just experienced, I'd say pretty much anything we try is gonna be rough. This is the end of days after all. That said, we're in luck, because at just 20 miles, the section of channel between Dover and Calais is by far the narrowest part. Humans have been crossing this body of water for millennia, so just because we can't catch a ride on a black market cabin cruiser doesn't mean we're forced to work with whatever band of street scum is currently running this tunnel route. Racket. Hell, a strong swimmer could make it across in under a day. Although, given this is what caterpillars look like right now, we'd probably end up getting ripped to shreds by a school of mutant herring. Instead, we should cruise the shoreline for a bit and try to find something seaworthy. I'm sure that's easier said than done, especially given Umbrella's extreme response to unsanctioned crossings, but people have made the trip in nothing more than rubber rafts before, so it's not like we need to find a battleship or anything. Fortunately, we still have the Land Rover so we can cover a lot more ground, even reaching areas outside the city limits. I'd start with local dry docks left over from before the collapse, along with any abandoned estates on waterfront property. Sailboats would be preferable, as it's unlikely any motors would still be serviceable after sitting idle for 14 years, although it wouldn't hurt to test them out. Even something as simple as a rowboat could theoretically get us there just fine. Once we found our getaway vessel, we should wait to launch until just after nightfall to maximize the amount of time we can spend traveling in darkness. Besides, once we're in the water, the only thing we'll need to see is the needle on our compass. I'm sure Umbrella has patrols out canvassing the channel to maintain their little monopoly on ocean travel, but if a vessel large enough to transport all these people can make it across frequently enough to turn into a business, our little dinghy or flex seal canoe should be able to slip by no problem. That said, we'll want to try and find some black tarps we can drape over the hold to make us as difficult a spot as possible. Ultimately, the group makes zero 
zero effort to find an alternate way across and just head straight for the tunnel entrance. Yeah, you know what? Forget what I said earlier. Nothing about this looks shady at all. Only three people died last month. See, only three deaths in one month. It's basically Amtrak. Unfortunately, this gravy train doesn't run on the milk of human kindness. Shocker, right? And here I thought Winston Churchill would just buckle under the weight of his immense generosity. When a bag of baubles from the family fails to impress, Jade reluctantly coughs up the keys to her ride, as though she wasn't about to abandon it on the side of the road anyways. What, were you planning on coming back for it or something? Should have forked those keys over the second he asked for payment. With the price of admission squared away, the gang loads up in the crowded van as directed by this bozo with the Hydra. Real practical there, Chris Redfield. I could totally see this guy strapping up with this novelty piece of sh over an AR, cause my stopping power. We'll see how that works out for you. At some point, this little funeral procession slows to a halt, and the organizers tell everyone to disembark with their mouths shut. Turns out this section of the tunnel is infested with liquors. You know, those big, ugly brain toad things from the OG? The good news is they can only hunt by sound, so long as a caravan of umbrella jerks doesn't suddenly roll in with their sirens blaring. We should be able to sneak this sh without too much difficulty. Oh, wait, that's exactly what happens. Turns out they found the Land Rover back at the rail yard and put two and two together. I guess it was only a matter of time before they decided to use their brains. Unfortunately for them, they pretty much stopped using their brains immediately afterwards. <laughs> And cue the panic fire. You'd think given Umbrella created these monstrosities, they'd immediately recognize the nature of the threat and clam up. Then again, keeping it together after seeing one of your dudes get tongue kissed to death seems like a pretty tall order. Oh, well, at least the rest of us can use the resulting cacophony of gunfire to slip away unmunched. Or not. Apparently, these things have sufficient daredevil sonar to pick up individual footsteps amidst a backdrop of unmuffled gunshots. Otherwise, I'd say we could have set up some kind of reinforced boombox to keep them distracted while we hightailed it down the train tracks. I mean, for Christ's sake, these things are prioritizing people that aren't even moving or making any noise over the guys popping off in every direction with machine guns. Naturally, four out of the five survivors from the convoy are, you guessed it, the group attached to Jade. Their tour guide directs them to a nearby service tunnel that leads them to the surface. Evidently, it's towed free, which kind of makes you wonder why they wouldn't have just brought their main group through there in the first place. For real though, no way in hell they only lost three people in one month with those things picking off people for just breathing. Not too far into the detour, Kiddo decides he's not going any further. But this isn't your ordinary flop on the floor at Walmart because you want a toy temper tantrum. It seems he's coming down with something. I wonder what that could be. Turns out the kid was bitten three days ago, which basically means he could turn it any possible second. Awesome. In light of this revelation, Francis decides to cut the dead weight and set off for the safe room on his own. Meanwhile, Jade launches into a hole. If you really love him, you'll take him out back behind the woodshed speech. But before she can force mom to pull the trigger fury style, the hired gun comes hauling back to the group with bad news. <laughs> Wow, look what crawled out of the toilet bowl. Should have just kept running. There's no reason to try to get a follow-up shot with that wrist breaker if the first one didn't put it down. Jade and company book it down the corridor into a small utility room. Well, get comfortable, folks. This is our new home now. No way in hell I'm going back out there without at least an AK-50. Let's hope by 2036, Brandon Herrera has finally put the finishing touches on it. Nah, it's cool. Daddy's found a long piece of pipe he can use to distract it while we run aimlessly through the foreign network of underground tunnels. I love a good sacrifice play, but let's face it, little Timmy ain't getting any better. I'm just saying, he's pretty much already a goner, so what if we just, you know, grab him by the arms and yeet him out towards the spider like young half squat? Why throw away a healthy man's life for no reason? After all, it only shrugged off a point blank shotgun blast like it was nothing. I'm sure a few bonks from a rusted out piece of garbage is more than enough to do the job. The sacrifice leaves the safety of the supply room and just sort of picks a direction in which to travel. Maybe someone should keep an eye on him in case it jabs him through the lungs before he can give the signal. I guess we'll just have to hope his spidey senses are in working order. All right, pops, it's showtime. Better swing away before this thing tears out your living guts and strangles you with... Whoa, he actually hit it? Well, don't stop now. Take off your shoe and finish the job. Jade and friends run out into the tunnel just in time to watch Super Dad get sliced in half, sausage party style. <laughs> 
better stick around and watch to make his sacrifice as meaningless as possible. I'm not sure why everyone's so damn surprised. The whole plan from the very beginning was for him to lay down his life so the rest of us could get away. We should have just taken off as soon as he gave the signal and not looked back. Just then, Jade remembers the small caliber handgun she picked up back at the docks. However, somehow, the beast that sucked down a 12 gauge triple tap is immune to her bullet spamming. Oh no, the six shot revolver ran out of ammo. Impossible. Better just discard it immediately instead of assuming you might ever come across a re-up. With Shelob hot on their trail, the gang makes a break for what they better hope for is an exit. As they pass through some kind of floodgate, Jade spots a conspicuously placed lever on the wall and jerks the mechanism into action. Wow, good thing there's no OSHA in France, apparently. No way Jade could have known that door was designed by Dr. Guillotine. My money's on this all being a fever dream induced by the mutant spider's venom. In reality, Jade's getting her very own silk sweater up against the wall. Well, whatever just happened, it looks like we finally found the light at the end of the service tunnel. Unfortunately, this is where the sidewalk ends for poor Junior. Jade tries to convince his mom to leave him to his fate, but apparently she's committed to serving as his first meal on the other side. Now on her own, Jade scales the last remaining obstacle to freedom, only to find a familiar face waiting for her at the top. Took you long enough, huh? Hang on, if you knew where she was headed this entire time, what was the point of forcing that confrontation down in the tunnel? You could have just staged an ambush at this and any other possible exits and waited until she fell right into your lap. I guess the art of war must have fallen out of print. I mean, just take a look at these genius tactics. Hey, I know, let's put her lightly armored and unarmored leader up front while the heavy hitters and their Chris Vector knockoff stand back and watch. You guys are just asking to get third partied by a bunch of self-styled resistant types stuck in 1944. And what a surprise, that's exactly what happens. Unfortunately for Jade, her liberators aren't so great at reading the room. As far as they can tell, she was standing next to them, so she must be one of them. Never mind the fact that she looks like she just climbed straight out of an outhouse while everyone else is clean as a whistle. Better hold on to your teeth. Sometime later, Jade comes to in the back of the truck along with the Polka King and a few of his henchmen. After a scenic drive through a field of crucified corpses, the prisoners arrive at the rustic French villa out in the countryside. Hmm, I wonder where this could have come from. I've got an idea. I believe this translates to something along the lines of live, laugh, love. And what's not to love about this place? It's got high ceilings, solid walls, and the whole thing is powered by immortal zombies pushing a giant turnstile. That's basically cold fusion. For real though, this dump is pretty much a massacre waiting to happen. All it takes is one boneheaded Bastos SOB to flip the switch on the zombie cages and this little social club becomes a guar concert. The captors haul Jack and Jade before the sentient man bun, puppeteering a chain smoking French stereotype. It's unclear what the reason for this exchange is, as he doesn't actually ask them any questions. In fact, he pretty much sits there on his tuffet, raving incoherently, while the super best friends take turns talking his entire operations. Hell, Jade even punches him in the face. <laughs> I know subtlety isn't exactly your strong suit, but you might want to cool it on the outburst while Jean Girard can easily have you lowered feet first into a literal pit of zombies. It'd be just like that one cannibal corpse song, only with better singing. Having had their audience with a death cult's leader, Jade and Jack are taken to a rickety old cell and tossed in together, alone, completely unrestrained. Well, I guess to be fair, they're used to locking up people that are actually brain dead, but still, you'd think they'd at least try to make it difficult for us. The lights begin to flicker as the undead power supply slows to a stop, prompting the guards to fish out one of the recently captured Umbrella Troopers to help incentivize the workforce. But they're not just gonna toss him in all willy-nilly. No, first they have to cut him down to size in the most brutal and over-the-top imaginable way to show that they mean business. It sure was nice of Dr. Salvador to come all this way from Spain to work his magic with a chainsaw. You can tell those two goons holding the mark by his arms feel totally safe, knowing it's a true professional hacking away with with reckless abandoned, and not some scrub. With the man meat cut down to manageable portions, old Sackface drops a hunk down into the cage sectioned off from the rest of the cattle. Evidently, this beauty queen gets first dibs. She quickly scarfs down the tasty giblets before belting out a scream that seems to turbocharge her fellow shamblers. Seeing this all go down gives Jade a raging clue, as she realizes these zombies have formed some kind of rudimentary command structure. While this earth-shattering revelation is fascinating and all, 
Jack Black has at least four more Jumanji movies to get back to. Fortunately, he's somewhat of a Jill Valentine when it comes to breaking out of poorly maintained prison cells. Hey, Jade, maybe stop pouting for a second to join in so you can actually get out of here. Seriously, do you really need convincing to get in on this action? Just as they're about to lift the door off its hinges, one of the jailers takes notice. Not this one, though. He gets an express ticket to the Flavor Town. Not sure why they wouldn't be shot on sight the second they open the door. I mean, it's not like these psychos are shy about inmate abuse. After slotting another cultist with his holdout push dagger, Jack Black loots the body for keys and weapons before freeing the rest of his team from a nearby cell. Meanwhile, Jade makes for the nearest exit. Only guess who's come to dinner. Oh, no! God damn, if only it were that easy back in the village. Apparently, the cultists never would have thought something like this could happen in a million years, as they left an entire Call of Duty match worth of automatic weapons sitting in giant unlocked cabinets right next to the cell block. Yeah, it was probably pretty stupid of them to do that. Unfortunately for Jade, she's partnered herself with a bunch of Warzone sweat lords that pick the racks clean before she could scrap up with so much as a slingshot, although guns aren't the only tools of destruction at her disposal. For the next order of business, we need to find a way out of here. But it seems every possible avenue of escape is blocked by an automated gate. And with all the labels in German, it's anyone's guess as to which lever goes to what. Should have taken that babble course when you had the chance. I guess our only option is to just hit them all and hope for the best. We are being shot at, after all. An alarm sounds as the floodgates spill open, releasing hundreds of shuffling undead into the rest of the facility. The move puts the wackos on the retreat, but the zombies ain't picky. Soon enough, our two heroes find themselves on their own. Good thing one of us knows gun Fu. <laughs> Dang, John Thick up in this bitch. Too bad Jade wasn't around to see it, though. Instead of sticking close to the one remaining ally she has left in this place, she decided to follow the screams to the Queen of the Damned for further investigation. Using the door controls, she manages to isolate the special infected from the rest of the herd before coming in close with the lumberjack biopsy. Jesus, has anyone in France ever heard of a saw sharpener? Even a trash tier chainsaw should run through human flesh like crap through a goose. Then again, maybe they keep it that way on purpose for maximum ouchy points. Eventually, the good doctor comes out ahead, and just in time to run into another horde. With sample in one hand and saw in the other, she bolts for the nearest exit, but a second group of biters has her cut off from the rest of the complex. Out of options, Jade locks herself inside one of the old bunk rooms, only to find out it's also a dead end. Desperate to retain her grant funding, Jade starts turning the place over in search of something she can use to carry the severed head. And better look for some ink ribbons while you're at it. Got a feeling we're gonna need a couple of shots at this one. Apparently, Jade feels it too, as she used the last of the juice on Jack Black's magic satellite phone to dial up her daughter and say her goodbyes. I can hardly criticize someone for reaching out to a loved one near the end, but God knows if we get out of this mess alive, being able to get a call off could very well be the difference between life and death. Imagine how sh kiddo would feel if she found out the final I love you call she received ended up costing her her mother's life later on. Oh well, we had a good run. Judging by the bolts backing out of the door frame, it looks like it's time for a valiant last stand. Only problem is, our chainsaw's all out of gas. Fortunately, this place is full of surprises. Your life, however, is more like a box of active grenades! <laughs> just what the doctor ordered. Although I question Jade's decision to pile them all up at the exit. Flimsy as that door may seem, it's still gonna soak up some of the blast. Plus, we can't get nearly far enough away to make it even remotely safe. The best use of our little party poppers would be to unpin a couple and chuck them out through the barred window on the door before retreating back to the table to take cover. We would then keep a couple ready to toss the second the door came down, as there's no telling just how many of them are out there, which is yet another reason why we shouldn't put all the regs in one basket. Not to mention the fact that the one we used to clock them all off could be a dud. <laughs> or a hang fire. Yeah, the four second fuse on grenades is more of a guideline than a rule. We're just lucky the first couple of freaks Gomer piled on that crate, or the lateral frag would have probably torn us to pieces. Dazed and confused, a shell-shocked Jade starts working her way through the maze of tunnels, only to come face to face with the surviving zombie. But Jeff Portnoy comes in clutch with a C96 before he can get to snacking. With all other escape routes blocked by rotten bodies, their only option is to make for the roof access. Having apparently shaken off the severe 
severe concussion from the grenade explosion, Jade nimbly parkours her way to the top of the broken ladder. However, it seems Nacho's eagle powers have long since flown the coop. After dumping the last of his pistol ammo, he grabs onto Jade's leg for a little human ladder action. But in the end, it's just too much linguine. R.I.P. Wonder Boy. At long last, Jade makes it back to fresh air, but in keeping with everything else we've seen so far, she's only managed to crawl out from one hole and into another. No sooner than she breaks the surface is she immediately descended upon by yet another rat pack of Umbrella soldiers, and it turns out the leader is a familiar face. Looks like somewhere along the line, Billy turned to the dark side, and apparently, it's treated her pretty well. She has her goons secure the base, so the long-lost sisters can enjoy a little family reunion in the most depressing atmosphere possible. However, after giving Jade a thorough dressing down for the typical, you weren't there for me bullshit, she orders the guards to leave the room so they can continue the conversation in private. As soon as they're alone, Billy's tone changes dramatically, and she expresses remorse for having ever sided with Umbrella in the first place. Evidently, she only put a price on Jade's head so the two of them could meet face to face one last time before years of racking up negative karma points finally put Billy in the dirt. Yup, might as well just take that one at face value. She then proceeds to dig out the Tic Tac sized tracking device the Umbrella jerks planted in Jade's forearm upon her capture. Of course, there's still one last piece of important business to attend to before she can send her on her merry way. Punch me in the face. <laughs> This touching family reunion concluded. Jade takes her severed zombie head and hits the road. Nice of Umbrella to bag that up for you. I wonder if that's all they did with it. Well, nothing left to do now but sprint straight towards the ocean and hope our friends at the university have just been hanging out in the open waiting for us to arrive. Just as she's about to reach the sand, Jade suddenly finds herself on the wrong end of a UMP-45. But wouldn't you know it, the first people she comes across after fleeing the bunker happen to be her friends from back home. The gunman escort her down to the beach so Dr. Expendable can conduct a brief medical exam and shoot the breeze over their newest paperweight. This seems important and all, but maybe we can do it on the boat ride back? Oh, and uh, by the way, Jade, you might want to let them know about what you just went through with Umbrella so they can sweep you for more bugs before you rejoin the rest of your group. Or did you actually buy some of that thinly veiled nonsense Billy sold you back at the bunker? Let's break it down real quick. They were willing to allocate two helicopters, lose dozens of men, including one with an actual name tag, and gun down any number of innocent people just to have maybe a chance at finding you. Do you honestly think that was all done just so your sister, who you haven't seen in over a decade, could spend five minutes chatting with you and then ask you to punch her in the face? Well, apparently she does, because Jade just gets right back to life on the love boat without even taking the time to mention it. Don't worry about everyone else's security. Oh, well, at least she made it back in time to catch her daughter's piano performance at the talent show. God, you have to be kidding me. This is the kind of crap they're wasting their time on. No wonder the whole world still looks like Ozfest. You should be training your children to field strip Kalashnikov rifles, not tickle the ivory. Whatever. At least now you can have the zombie head analyzed by the university's top scientist, which turns out that's also Jade. Wait, how did anything get done on this place without her? It seems risking life and limb to recover that smelly meat melon might actually pay off. After pulling an all-nighter with Dr. Carmen, the two discovered the secret to the super freak's zombie whispering. It seems she mutated a special gland on her neck that secretes a substance the zombies can smell, which somehow allows her to transmit commands related to pushing a giant power mill thing. But the discoveries don't stop there. Further sciencing produces two distinct compounds they can use to manipulate the zeros, one to draw them in and one to keep them away. All that's left to do now is try them out on a real live dead person. We just have to get permission first. Naturally, Jade humors her colleague's intent to follow protocol long enough to get her out of the room, and once the coast is clear, she loads up on the tranquilizer and heads out on a rubber raft for a little fishing expedition. With help well out of reach, should anything go awry, Jade picks a winner from a nearby watery graveyard and hauls the specimen on board. Sure, just go ahead and turn your back on the zombie you just fished out of the water. Don't even bother bounding his hands or feet or anything. I'm sure it'll remain totally docile while you finish screwing around with the cootie shot. <laughs> 
it's a good thing that everything in the post-apocalypse has to call its shots like an anime villain before doing literally anything. Otherwise, Jade might have actually been in real danger there. Never mind the fact that a bloated corpse that spent who knows how much time underwater still reacts to anxiety medication like a normal person. After wrapping up today's catch, Jade returns to the ship and strolls right past security like she's not lugging around a comically oversized backpack containing 150 pounds of dead rotting body parts. Once back at her lab, Jade unpacks the living dead girl and ties her up with the finest Harbor Freight toe straps money can buy. But before she can get to testing out the zombie repellent, a surprise visit from her daughter puts the whole thing on hold. Hang on, you didn't even think to lock the door. What if someone came in that you didn't have direct control over? Don't you think people would freak out if they knew you smuggled a zombie on board without telling anyone? Not to mention the fact that it could easily break free from the meager restraints you cobble together and go rampaging through the ship like Dawn in 28 weeks later. I've got this all under control. Oh, you do? Okay, good, because for a minute there, I was pretty much certain you had absolutely no idea what you were doing. Here's an idea. Why not just hack its arms and legs off to make sure it can't possibly get away? I mean, unless there's some kind of physical fitness portion to the test you're planning on running, all you really need to gauge its reactions is just a head on a torso. Nah, I'm sure everything will work out just fine. You know what? Don't even worry about sending your daughter out of the room. I'm sure having her stand back by the door is sufficient to keep her out of harm's way. After all, it's not like we've seen them smell a single drop of blood through solid objects. Jade spritzes up with the zombie camo and casually strolls up to the brain eater before placing her hands right next to its open mouth. Sure enough, it seems her hypothesis was correct. Awesome. Now, we have a special spray we can use to keep zombies from sniffing us out while on missions. You know, just like we had back in London. Boy, I'm sure glad we risked the lives of everyone on board to make this happen. Unfortunately, it seems curiosity gets the better of young B, and she can't help but come in for a closer look. This sudden introduction of unmuffled odor sends the zombie into a fit of rage, causing it to break free from its restraints. Despite Jade's best efforts to regain control of her test subject using hug therapy, the Bride of Frankenstein sheds the blocker and storms through the ship's corridors in pursuit of the child, ultimately charging face first into Dr. Redshirt before security can put it down for good. Jesus Christ, what a cluster that was. Although, I'm honestly a little surprised it even went that well. What possible reason would you have for not keeping a weapon handy in case this thing broke free and started tearing the place apart? Besides, what the hell were you planning to do with it afterwards? Ask it nicely to leave? But wait, it gets worse. Look who showed up to play. Yeah, it turns out Billy had her henchman bug the zombie head, knowing Jade would bring it back to the mothership for further study. Who could have seen that coming? Man, Jade, you're really on a roll. It's a good thing you pretty much do everything around here, or someone might try and give you a stern talking to right now. After setting up a little playpen in the middle of a box canyon, Miss Umbrella herself, Evelyn Marcus, invites the ship's captain over to parlay, and it seems she only wants one thing. Is Jade Wesker valuable enough to put the lives of your people in danger? How very relevant. I'm sure he's asking himself the same thing. However, it seems the old man's got an ace up his sleeve. He takes the opportunity to politely inform Evelyn that his people are in possession of a 14-year-old umbrella hard drive containing rather sensitive information. And what a shame it would be if any of those juicy details were to go public. Boom, checkmate, corpo rat. Better pack up all your toys and hit the road before we expose you for tax evasion or whatever. Although, gee, I gotta wonder, why should she not immediately spitting out her wine upon learning of this trump card. Maybe she thinks we're bluffing. Or maybe she realizes there's no one left on Earth who actually cares. Dude, have you lost your fucking mind? Take a look around. What do you think the zombies are gonna retweet your grand expose? Besides, Umbrella basically owns the entire world at this point. Time to put the Monopoly money away and ante up with something big before they can send your little pleasure cruise to the bottom of the ocean. That said, even if you do turn over Jade, I can pretty much guarantee guarantee they're gonna roll on you anyways. Think about it for a minute. Why would they capture Jade and release her with a tracking device only so they could track you down and force you to turn her over again? If she's all they wanted, they wouldn't have let her out of the bunker in the first place. Let's just hope you people actually preserved something useful, like a Bofors gun. Upon learning of Evelyn's demands, Jade decides to boldly sacrifice herself for the greater good of the community, which is probably a wise choice. After what happened earlier with the zombie escaping, we'd probably have a full on Baruka Hill prison right
ride on her hands if the other passengers realized they only wanted her. Before turning herself in, Jade stops to let her 10-year-old daughter know about the bug out bag she stashed under the bed. And if dad won't go with you, I need you to go on your own. Hear that, small child? Don't listen to anything your other parent says. Just load up and jump overboard at the first sign of trouble. I'm sure she's old enough to correctly identify the exact set of circumstances in which she should take this advice. Hmm, I wonder what's all in this bag anyway. Let's see, gold coins, some kind of radio, and a SIG P226. Just what every unsupervised child needs. After saying her goodbyes, Jade makes the walk of shame over to the umbrella camp, longing to be warmly greeted by this little number. Hey. But look at where I am, dead up. God, no wonder Netflix sh canned this mess after one season. Turns out, it's not all Evelyn's fault, though. Billy has been using some sort of mind control device to work her old boss like a puppet during diplomatic engagements, because the power umbrella wields totally comes from this woman's mini pantsuits, and not the legion of heavily armed sociopaths at its disposal. Speaking of which, Billy orders them to storm the ship because, of course, she does. How the hell did no one see this coming? Before Captain Price and company can get to work, Jade produces the vial of a zombie catnip and smashes it on the ground. I'd say something about no one bothering to search her or zip tie her hands, but <sighs> this point. Honestly, I'm starting to think the very idea of restraining a prisoner has been completely erased from public memory at this point. At any rate, everyone just sort of stares at Jade like she's lost her mind, maybe because she really has. You realize that smells don't immediately travel around the world at light speed. It's gonna take a while for the wind to pick up and blow it around. Plus, the nearest zombies could be miles away for all we know. Just then, the perimeter guards call in to report a massive horde of zombies coming from literally every direction. Fortunately, they're all so well equipped to handle this situation. Yeah, just go ahead and charge straight at the zombies while spraying bullets from the hip. You guys are really doing your part out there. Now's when everyone should just haul ass back to the helicopter so you can hose them all down from the air while they're homing in on the source of the smell. Seriously, what's the point of holding your ground just to protect a canvas tent? With our guards on the verge of being overrun, Billy calls in a few machine gun quadcopters to handle business. Only it seems they haven't quite worked out the whole of not shooting your own people thing. Meanwhile, Jade uses the chaos to slip away from her captors. Apparently, she's still got enough of the zombie repellent on to keep from being torn to shreds by the undead onslaught, allowing her to narrowly make it back aboard the ship as it's taking off. If the plan was to call in the horde from the very beginning, why not just stay on board the ship and do it from there? It still would have brought the zombies in the same general direction as if you did in the camp. And clearly, they weren't solely focused on attacking just that one spot. Now, the only thing left to do is make sure they don't get any helicopters off the ground and come back for revenge. Press the f***ing button! Well, I definitely like the sound of that. What are we looking at here? Scud missiles? Rods from God? No, it's a giant crocodile they've been keeping in an electronically induced coma while sailing around the world. Weapons are just too barbaric. Truly civilized people only use mutant reptiles to kill one another. Realizing there's no other option, the captain and first mate reluctantly key in the launch controls and deactivate the massive pair of Raycons, feeding in an endless stream of ASMR. The sudden decline in dopamine levels sends King K. Rule into a fit of violent rage, which for some reason doesn't turn it on the people who have been dragging it around for six years. Meanwhile, back on land, Billy's infinite ammo quadcopters just finished off the last of the zombies, but little does she realize she's about to get a visit from an early 2000s sci-fi classic. From out of nowhere, Dino Croc comes sprinting in off the beach right for her, knowing when she's beat, Billy makes a break for the helicopter while her drones keep the beast at bay, but the heli attack does little more than piss it off. No matter, Billy finds a grenade and gives it to Super Croc. Wow, some showstopper that was. All it took was a single blast from one of the most common weapons ever produced to knock it right on its ass. Besides, how exactly was this thing supposed to take out the helicopters anyways? Well, that works, I guess. Although it's quite a leap of faith to assume they'd be dumb enough to hover 20 feet over the top of the thing. Then again, this is Umbrella we're talking about here. With the bad guys in full retreat, Jade heads back to her cabin to reflect on all the horrible decisions she's made so far, only to suddenly remember the one involving her daughter. Guess who listened to mommy earlier? Jade and her husband commandeer a boat and head to shore. But just as they're about to land, old Crocosaur comes back around to properly thank her for letting him off the hook. With Arjun out of commission, Jade 
shades left to find B on her own. The good news is, she didn't make it too far. Just as the two are reunited, Aunt Billy arrives on the scene to make it a standoff. Apparently, she's really upset about the disproportionate amount of screen time her twin sister has been getting over the years, so she's decided to take Jade out for good to improve her own higher ability on future projects. It's still always the f***ing Jade show! Tell me about it. Desperately outgunned, Jade decides to lower her pistol and throw herself at the mercy of her disgruntled sibling. But in the words of Mr. Rogers, if you want to make it in this life, you'd better be willing to gun down a family member in front of their own child. As Jade lies bleeding on the ground, she watches helplessly as her daughter is carried off in the clutches of corporate greed. And since this whole series is gone for good, I guess we're left to believe she just died right there, probably after getting worked over by a few dozen zombies. What a shame. At the end of this long and winding road, Umbrella came out on top. They've got Jade's daughter and seemingly took out the single most important person on the planet, apparently. Then again, that only happened because her lousy parents led B to run off after they had already won. Ultimately, had Jade followed her advice instead of her terrible instincts, she could have given Umbrella the slip before any of this ever happened. And for that reason, I think Resident Evil was beaten. Moral of the story, the only good zombies are dead ones. Gamer Sups Nerds, the fourth of the four secret waifu shakers is out now. Clearly, she has a cheeky personality, quite the handful. Pick one up to support the channel and your KD ratio. Use my code unbeaten to get 10% off anything else.